All right, what up, guys? We are live. Apologies for delay. We had some tech issues, but we are all good now. So this is going to be a juicy debate, potentially YouTube debate of the century here, because we're bringing two totally opposite people together. We got Farah, who's definitely much more on the feminist side. Andrew, who's a hardcore feminist, hardcore SJW. Now, Andrew, who's on the conservative side. So we're going to be discussing uh, feminism and just, uh, you know, gender dynamics and stuff like that. It's going to be a pretty free-forming debate. Um, I am going to be enforcing interruptions. So if anyone is consistently talking over another person, I will mute them. And then I will, uh, you know, so there's equal speaking time. Other than that, pretty much anything else is fair game. Um, I think we'll do just a quick opening statement by both parties and that will just be a free flow. So you guys can go back and forth and I will only step in if it's one person is unable to talk. So that's the only time I'll step in. Uh, okay. So yeah, so we're going to be discussing feminism. So I don't know, Far, why don't you start off by saying why you think feminism is a good thing? Um, I mean, there's like a million different shades of feminism. I think obviously the mainstream version of it can, uh, feel more like virtue signaling than actually having like material consequences in society but i think a cardinal reason why feminism in its purest form is good is because it's trying to just reassociate traits that are associated with women with productivity uh because usually when we think of women we think of like agreeableness and a lack of conscientiousness and we think about productivity and like social values we think of more masculine traits so i think feminism is just a good philosophy for trying to just reintroduce feminine virtues and just, I don't know, give them more credit in society. I guess that's the vaguest way of putting it. Okay. I don't know exactly how we're going to be talking about feminism yet, but yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Andrew, you don't think feminism is a good thing, do you? I don't. Uh, so here, because what Farah just said doesn't actually tell me much, I actually went to uh, her Instagram to try to figure out what her positions on this were, but it just kind of looked like she trolls. Doesn't I, I didn't really see anything as far as feminism went. So I, I wrote down a few things here. So Farah, we can go after women's suffrage and women's right to vote, why it's bad for democracy, or we could do uh, all of women's rights come from men or women are less competent generally in positions of authority or power. Women's equality is laughable and absurd. We can do Christianity treats women better than secularism. Progressive values for women lead to less fulfilling lives for progressive women on average. And if literally none of those sound good, then I'd really like to know how you're a feminist. Do any of those sounds good? Sound good to you, Far? Um, I guess we could talk about why you think women's equality is a bad idea, and the idea of like, what what was the thing after that? You said progressive. Progressive values for women lead to less fulfilling lives for progressive women on average. Yeah, we could uh, focus on those too. Okay, so okay. you want to you want to focus on uh, women's equality is uh, laughable and absurd. Yeah, I guess you could. Let's start off with that, and then we can move on to the next one when you guys are done with that. So why don't you just give your opening thought on that, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so women uh, women can't make decisions about their own rights because they can't enforce their own rights. So since they they have no enforcement mechanism other than men, all their rights come from men, so they can't actually be equal there's always going to be a differential and that's a necessary biological truth. It's not saying that uh, women can't be uh, equal in the eyes of men as far as, um, you know, you, you can't murder them, abuse them, things like this uh, within the commons that you would do with men, but there can't actually be egalitarianism. It's not, it's not even possible uh, because women have no enforcement mechanism. So since there's no enforcement mechanism, there's, there's, there's just, it's, it's a laughably absurd idea. We have no enforcement mechanism because women's rights are legally created by men. Is that what you mean? What do you well, mean? Well, no, they're enforced by men. So if, so in other words, if men collectively tomorrow say you have no rights, you don't have any anymore and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing anybody, any woman anywhere can do about it. Um, that that's just the truth of the world. Uh, if men collectively, and, and we do sometimes men do anyway, I'm not, I'm not grouping myself as a monolith, but men do do this. And in, in some nations, they just say, Hey, women don't have rights and they don't have rights and there's nothing that they can do about it. How would that happen in America where we do have democracy and we're not just led by, I don't know, men using their physical strength to dominate us. Like how could men tomorrow collectively say, you know what, like half our population, you no longer have rights. You're second well, if men tomorrow say there's no democracy in America, there's no democracy in America tomorrow either. 
if men tomorrow say that we're going to have a communist nation tomorrow, there will be a communist nation as well. So if men, as, uh, as far as a monolith go, let's say you don't even need 50, 100 percent, but let's just say 30 percent, something like this, say we don't want democracy anymore. There isn't going to be a democracy anymore. They say they don't want communism. There isn't going to be, or they want communism. That's what it'll be. If they say they want socialism, that's what it'll be. So essentially men are the, the holders of what society is going to look like, what the economic status is going to be, what everything is going to be because they're the enforcement mechanism. Okay. So if that's true, if men are the enforcement mechanism, why does that then mean that women's equality is a bad idea? Well, I didn't say it was a bad idea. I mean, it is, but what what my position is is that it's laughable that egalitarianism is even possible because women have no way to enforce their rights they have to use men to enforce their rights so since they have to use men to enforce their rights they don't really have any rights because all the rights come from men guys one quick thing the whole chat is complaining i don't know which one of you guys is typing but the typing noise is really really loud uh i don't know if you yeah can i like, hear it i hear it too i don't know right. if you can tone down the noise or just uh Keep your computer a little bit far away from your phone. It's just uh, a lot of people. Well, she's on it. Hang on. She's on a cell phone and I'm not typing. So far, are you using your computer to take notes? Yeah, I'm on my I'm on my phone and computer. But oh, OK. Also Maybe you can just uh, like, yeah, move your computer a little bit further from the phone so the audio doesn't come in. OK. OK. Continue. Oh, that's that's the that's my position. It's it's absurd to. It's absurd to have any belief in egalitarianism on its face because uh, it's not actually possible except through the graciousness of, of men. It's absurd to have egalitarianism because women cannot physically enforce their own rights, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so egalitarianism is not, it's not true. It's not real. It's false. <laughs> it's only possible through uh, men, in other words. It's not possible through women. Women can't be equal unless men allow them to be equal, which means... It's paradoxical because um, this means that they're never going to be equal because men are going to always be the arbiters of what that equality is because women can't enforce it. So, But why does the notion of egalitarianism have to be predicated on physical strength or like who gets to enforce it? Well, what else could it be predicated on? Principles of like what's best for society. And Whether what happens if somebody violates those principles? Equal, sure. like, why would it be based off the enforcement? What mechanism? happens if somebody violates those principles? What do you mean? Well, so if you have a society in which you have laws and government and things like this and whatever social social contracts you come up with, what happens if one side violates those principles or a person or an individual or a group violates those principles? What would you do with them? You would, well, I, I would think arrest them maybe or uh, punish them or do something punitive or put them in prison or something like that. And so you're right back to the enforcement mechanism again. So there's really no way around it. The enforcement mechanism is from men, will always be from men. And so it's paradoxical to say that women can have equal rights because even if they do have equal rights, it's just because men have allowed them to. But does that make women's equality laughable or like an absurd idea? Well, it's paradoxical on its face, so it has to be laughable because there is never going to be such thing as women's equality. Just an illusion thereof, because if it's decided by even a small minority majority of men, minority majority being like 10, 15, 20 percent, they just won't have it anymore and there's nothing they can do about it. So uh, essentially, always they have to defer to men for this. I guess, would you apply the same logic to race? Like if someone's a racial minority and then a larger racial majority just decides like we're going to overpower you physically and with enforcement nope. mechanisms? Nope, it wouldn't work the same way. It would just be the same man paradox. So if men decided to take rights away from a single group of men, they could do that, yes. But it, let's say if it was a racial minority of women um, or something like this that wanted to take away rights, or even if it was a racial majority of women who wanted to take away rights from a minority of men, they likely couldn't do it without using men as enforcement. So it's always, it always comes back to this no matter what. So it'll be in this particular case, if you're talking about race, it would be, yes, groups of men can take away rights for whatever reason, based on whatever proxy they have from other men and have always been able to do so. Okay. I guess I just disagree that that makes women's equality laughable because we would need a male. Well, then explain how you can be equal. 
because I don't think equality is predicated on physical strength. I don't think equality is necessarily predicated on whether you're able to enforce it yourself. Then what's it predicated on? What's a right predicated on? Where do you think a right comes from absent enforcement of the right? I mean, conservatives will argue that, you know, a lot of, you know, fetuses in the womb have rights, even though they can't physically defend themselves, that they're still worthy of human rights. So uh, what you're saying you know, they there can't defend for themselves. So does that mean that like, mm -hmm. you know, fetuses shouldn't be deserving of human rights if you are pro-life because women could just decide to just abort them? Like, I just well, don't so this is this is this is question begging. Right. So I'm asking you where do rights come from. And you say, well, conservatives will say that uh, children in the womb have rights. Well, that may be true or may be false, but that doesn't actually answer my question, which I'm asking you, where do you think rights come from? Well, I guess what I'm saying is where they don't come from is physical strength. Yeah, I don't care where they don't come yourself. from. I want to know where they do come from. Where do they come from? Um, I guess it's subjective. Like some people think it comes from just a religious sense of you're a person, you're deserving of human rights, you're deserving of prosperity and happiness. Or you could argue that I guess it depends what you think are fundamental rights, like which rights. Well, that's, are that's the question I'm asking you is if you don't have an explanation or grounding for why you think that people should have rights at all or where rights even come from, then what else could they be other than an enforcement mechanism by groups of people for what they think other people should be allowed to do or not do? I don't think because I don't have a clean definition of where rights come from, that means that I have to just defer that rights should just come from who can physically enforce them where else could they come from then if there's no clean definition it means that tyranny is what di dictates rights well n no well in your case for democracy you might say it's a tyranny of majority or you could say uh, that it's not a tyranny because it's the majority it wouldn't really matter which way you framed it the truth of the matter is though is that you have to at some some point contend with this issue which is if you don't think that there's a grounding for rights and they're just all subjective based on cultures and people groups and things like this all over the world, that's fair enough. But then you would have to also say in that same breath, if they're all just subjective, then who's giving them to who and who can take them away from who? Sure. So I guess rights are established within a civilization. It's or within a usually within national borders. It's decided like what what do people need in order to have a prosperous life or to have like an equal opportunity? I'm just saying usually the physical enforcement is there to ensure that like to ensure a bottom line, to ensure that people at the bottom, even if they're handicapped, like I just don't understand why this example is uh, you're using it to apply it to women. Well, the Greeks said that uh, without law, there can be no freedom. And what they're saying there is if you don't have an enforcement arm, for what keeps you free being like things like a military, um, things like police, things that are enforcement laws. In other words, uh, you can't actually enforce any of these rights. How could you how could you possibly do it? So since men are the enforcement arm, there's really no way out of the fact that you get your rights from them, whether you like it or not. You could say that egalitarianism is, as a principle is great, but that really is just begging the question again as to. Who's giving you your rights? You're not giving them to yourself. So in other words, Farah, you didn't wake up one morning with rights of which you gave yourself. You have rights which other people allow you to have and can easily take away if they so chose and there wouldn't be anything you could do about it. That's my whole point. Sure. Your entire neighborhood one day can just decide, we hate Andrew. He's annoying. He's not mowing his lawn. Let's go kill him. Does that mean your rights are allowed? Not if they were women. Powered by a large not if they were people? women. They could do that if they were men, though. I agree. I would agree that men could I'm likely. I'm sure 20 women could come and just decide <laughs> we're going to overtake Andrew because he's not mowing his lawn. I think it would be far more difficult for them to enforce it than 20 men. Wouldn't you agree? And I think that they would probably appeal to men <laughs> in order to uh, exercise the enforcement, which is what they do right now. Which is what women do right now. They they appeal to men to exercise all enforcement of all of their rights and all of the things that they want. They can't appeal to women because women can't enforce their rights and if never have been able five to. Five women or like three women, two men come tomorrow, kidnap you, tie you to a chair mm -hmm. and start beating you. And I say, oh, well, he can't fight back right now. We're the one who decides if he eats or sleeps or gets water. Does that mean your rights are laughable? 
the basis of your rights are laughable. That makes no sense. So what's your no no no? Enforcement listen, mechanisms listen. are subjective. So if I decide hang on, to hang on. You under a tyrannical situation and torture you, actually, you're making my point. Laughable? You're making my point for me. So oh. if my rights are being violated and I'm unable to physically do something about it, so two men and three women have tied me up. They're now depriving me of life, liberty, and happiness by doing this. And I can't physically do something about this. Who would I appeal to to do something about this? If you can't appeal to someone, it means the basis of your rights are laughable. Yeah, unless you can tell me what the basis of rights are, which is what I've asked you in the beginning. The legal basis of your rights. Yeah, I know. But what is the, the legal basis of the rights come from what? In America, it comes from the Constitution. Which came from? Currently, the Constitution will only be amended legally. Like, I don't think men can just overpower that right now. Really? They tried to uh, before in the Civil War. Currently. Currently Current law, why, been... What's the difference between, between now and then? They tried to once before. What do you mean? So if they don't like, if men don't like the hand that they've gotten, they don't like the nation that they're in, they don't like the government that they have, they don't like the circumstances they're in collectively, they seem to be able to do something about that. They can overthrow the entire nation, for instance. Can you point to a country in history you can ever think of where women have collectively overthrown the nation with force? Okay, so by enforcement mechanism, you don't mean through like legal or civil me measures, you mean through like revolution and those are both physical measures a legal measure is a physical enforcement how else could it how how else could it work like what would what stops you from breaking the law it's a penalty right doesn't somebody enforce the penalty i'm just saying revolutions could be spearheaded by anyone i just don't understand why this is like such a gendered idea for you that like women's rights are laughable because a majority could overtake them like that's the case with any larger group of people. It's not the case. So for instance, let's say you had a dynamic where you had 20% men to a 80% female ratio. The men would still be in charge. We know this. Know that's true. Well, not only can I demonstrate that this is true by showing you nations post-war where a lot of the men up to two thirds in some cases were completely wiped out and the men were still in charge. The reason is because even then, the power dynamic is so it's sloped uh, such in the favor of men that women still need them to enforce their rights. Women are unable to physically do this type of work themselves, at least collectively. There might be individual women who are able to be police officers, uh, great military officials, things like this. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm talking about on average and in generalities here. And in general, no, women can't enforce rights and have never been able to. Their rights collectively come from men. Okay. So women's rights are laughable because men, if needed, can use enforcement mechanisms, whether legally or just purely physically, to overpower them. Our children's well, rights also then laughable. Hang on. Back up. Because you, you're, you're well, you're actually straw manning, right? Remember, okay. I said the word egalitarianism, meaning equality. Equality is laughable, not women's rights, not giving rights to women, in other words. But e egalitarianism and equality is laughable because it's paradoxical. And the great paradox of it is that you would be appealing to the same group of people who can then take your rights away while at the same time considering yourself equal to those people. It's laughable. It's a paradox. <laughs> I just don't know if that's a good basis. Like, I don't think you're less than of a human because you are missing a leg or because you're of older age and you probably can't fight back against the younger generation. Gen Z can decide today we're going to kill off Gen, Gen X. Does that mean... There's a terrible, yeah. terrible right. argument, too, because I'm not you're again straw manning. I'm not talking about a person who has a disability, for instance, being a lesser or greater human being. That's no, has no that has no merit to the argument. Laughable. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying to you that it's not that women are lesser human beings. In fact, I consider them the, the same as far as, um, you know, how they should be treated. Uh, they should definitely be treated with respect and dignity and all those wonderful things that we would expect in society for everybody to treat everybody that way. But that's not going to change the grounding fact that um, that the rights come from men and are enforced by men. Are senior citizens rights laughable? Is their equality laughable? Not not saying that not straining you by saying that you're assuming they're less than is their equality laughable? 
because they could be physically overpowered by gen generation y generation z well okay because so we can just decide like this is so this is actually right to vote from senior citizens yeah so this is this and is pro- overpower then we can decide to yeah yeah no listen nursing homes. listen you're actually you're 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 making a pivotal mistake here if you're saying to me like can men take rights away from other men the answer is yes yes can uh men take rights away from women the answer is yes can women take rights away from men the answer is no no, they can't. Really? Yeah. Millennial women can't take away rights from senior citizens. No, not unless men allow it. Because if men decide collectively not to allow it, there's nothing you can do. In other words, an entire you can never gender decide to take a right away from an older generation co-gendered. Like I just don't men, understand where this like. Men, yes, gender- men can still take rights away from men. This has been established fifty times, but women can't take the rights away from men. That's the problem that you have is that even if all of you collectively came together tomorrow, like, let me ask you this, just reasonably think about this. Say the entirety of the human race decided one day that they were going to go to war with each other, all of the men and all of the women. Who do you think would win? All of the men. I'm not disputing the fact that men could overpower women. I'm now, hang on, hang on. That- for the rest of the thought exercise, pretend for a second the entirety of all of women went to war with 20% of the population of men and all the other men stayed out of it. Who do you think would win? Honestly, I don't know. I think war is more about phys- is more is about other things than just physical strength. It's about like weaponry. It's about how you can strategize. So I, I don't Andrew, know. Are we, assuming, are we, are we assuming a world without like modern weapons and modern technology, just like kind no, of even like, in a world with modern weapons and modern technology. Okay. Even then 80%, I would honestly, in that case, I'm being honest. I genuinely think women in that case, why we're using modern technology. Yeah. So why do you think that women, uh, who are generally speaking inept with technology, generally, we're not saying all women, but generally speaking, they're inept. We know this because of who goes into the technological and STEM fields. When we have egalitarianism, guess who it still is. It's men. (laughs) They overwhelmingly are the engineers. They are overwhelmingly the people who fix everything in society. They're the ones who create and operate that very same technology. I don't think that highly specialized tech like that even then would be something that women could easily deploy against even 20% of men. You're talking about something here. If you scale it up, you start to kind of recognize how, how lopsided the power dynamic really is and always will be. There's not anything that can be done about it. That's what makes this a great paradox to appeal to men for rights. And at the same time, say that you're equal to men is laughable. Sure. You didn't say all of women and all of men in this instance, you said 80% women, 20% men. Even then, so yeah. Even then, there could still be, even though less women go into STEM, in that 80% pool, there could be more women who are technologically inclined. Than I still think they would lose. I still think if you if you were, I still think they would lose. But the thing is, the point being is, is that um, even if they wouldn't, in that particular case, just that one particular case, maybe it just took 30% of men, whatever, whatever the collective was. Okay. The I'm power like, dynamic is ridiculously technologically inept. Senior citizens are also technologically inept. If you mm-hmm. put all of generation men can take C, rights away from men for the three hundredth millennial time. women against yeah. all mm-hmm. of senior citizen men, I think women would win in terms of warfare technologically. Okay. Then, Only okay. Listen. Listen. Like, hang on. Hang on. Andrew, Andrew, let, let, let her finish. Let her finish. Yeah, but she's strawmanning the entire I, position. I, I, no, she no, doesn't no, understand she, it. She, she's, she's not interrupting you. Just, 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 just let her finish. No, no, he can, go he ahead. Can go on. Okay. Go. Listen. You're strawmanning the position. I think you don't understand it. You can have great monoliths of one versus the other and possibly overwhelm them. That's really not the point. It's that if women were to all the millennial women were to decide tomorrow that the senior citizens needed to lose all their rights. They would still have to appeal to men in order to allow that to happen. So if all the other men were like, nope, they still have rights, women still couldn't do anything. That's my point. Why would we have to appeal to them? This thought experiment involved warfare. If you're at war, who are you appealing to? You're just again your technological listen, what or whatever the disperse the the uh, disbursement is. Okay, let's say it's like two hundred to one, right? So men can take out like 20 women to one woman's fine. Or, or let's just say it's two to two, two to one. It doesn't really matter. Right. What I'm saying is, is that as long as men are involved, 
in governance, and as long as men are involved in society, you and your rights and your appeals to take rights away or give rights to any group of people at any time has to necessarily be an appeal to men. So even within the confines of the thought experiment, if we took all of that out, well, I could just yield the entire thing to you and say, sure, maybe in that instance, I'll just give it to you. It just doesn't really matter, though. <laughs> I'm not refuting that you have to appeal to other people for your rights. I'm refuting that that appeal means that your equality is laughable. Same way you probably wouldn't argue that just because a senior citizen, again, has to appeal to the general public, most of whom are younger, most of whom are more technologically inclined than them. Like I said, even a millennial woman is more technologically inclined than a senior citizen man probably at this point. That doesn't mean their equality is laughable. Listen, the senior citizens who are men understand, just like all men do, that other men are in a position to take their rights away anytime they choose, unless you have some type of collective that can stop that. That's why we have a military. That's why we have all these different things to enforce the rights. <clears throat> this is well understood. You claiming, wait a second, what if a bunch of women got together to take the rights away from senior citizens? Well, they could do that. But you would have to bank on all of the other men outside of that, external to that, allowing you to do that, because if they said no, you couldn't. Whereas if the roles were reversed and a group of men were to decide to do that, they could. And if you opposed it, you couldn't stop it. That's the difference. Okay. I still don't see the equivalency between needing to appeal to majority and meaning that your rights are laughable, but... I guess if your basis of rights is based off physical enforcement, then. No, listen, this is fundamental and pivotal to any argument you'll ever make in your entire life. All of your rights are based on enforcement unless you can give me a basis for them outside of that. That just can't be the case because the notion of rights wouldn't need to exist. We wouldn't need to establish rights for people if each person could physically enforce it themselves. The whole point of establishing baseline of rights is because you're assuming people are fundamentally different physically and intellectually. So how can you say your rights don't matter because you're physically inferior when that differentiation is what justifies your rights in the first place? That's why we even establish rights. You haven't justified rights at all. You just say this is what justifies them, the fact that there's inferiority between different people. Okay, is that the justification, that the justification for rights is based on uh, inferiority is that is that what you're saying is your justification for a right it's a differences the differences is the justification was as uh intellectually and physically capable as the person next mm -hmm. to them i don't think we would need to establish human rights okay so you, probably so you think that rights then come from your mind they don't come from any external source just people make them up when did i what do you mean well i mean if absent something for you to ground this axiom on some, unless it, that's all it is, just like a, a pure axiom to your own preferences. You'd have to tell me what you're justifying having a right on where it comes from. Where does a right actually come from? Other than your, your mind, you made it up. If that's the case, then you have, then you have a big problem. So did it, did it come out of, out of the people's minds or does it come external? Did they come from God? Like our, our founders said, or where do they come from? I'm asking you, where do rights come from for you? Because I'm saying, God. I think rights, what? I think, I think that, uh, well, as far as innate human rights, the way that you perceive them, we don't perceive them the same way, but I would say that I would ground, I ground all of my epistemology and ontology on my faith. So all the things that I think are informed by faith and would be informed by God. But from your perspective, your secular perspective, you're just saying that rights are just something that people made up one day. And then you say, but enforcement isn't necessary, which is really bizarre and makes no sense. And but I'm trying to get you to square it. Necessary. I said enforcement is crucial to rights. Then rights come from men. If, so if enforcement is crucial to them, men are the enforcers of those rights, not women. So therefore, you're you're basically like said, begging rights men for rights. What the majority establishes is those rights. But I'm saying just because you're rights can be taken away how does that make a, the basis of equality laughable because it means that you would always be appealing to people who can take your rights away as being equal with you when you can't take theirs away you can take them away but does that make it justified nope you can't take them away men can take them away but not but not women women can't take men's rights away 
not right, monolithically. Democracy. If a majority of voters decide to change the basis of rights, again, they could take it away from the minority of senior citizens. Well, first of all, we're not in a democracy. We're in a republic. And it takes more than a simple majority of which women do outnumber men, but it's only slightly so. They would still need even men in that coalition to do so. So women as a singular entity can't do anything outside of voting. Uh, but even with voting, they would need men. But absent voting, they certainly can't enforce their rights, whereas men can enforce their rights even absent voting. So if we don't like what's going on at the ballot box or in the nation or in the country, we can physically do something about that. We can change the regime. We can change the president. We can change whatever the fuck we want. And um, society basically just has to deal with it. There's nothing that they can do about it. Uh, they're at the mercy of men. So men are at the mercy of men and women are at the mercy of men. But all of them are appealing to men for rights. Okay, so you said you're a Christian, right? So you believe in a theological basis for rights. So what do you see as rights then, since you have a more objective understanding of them? Since mine's secular. Um, I don't think that we have innate rights the way that you think that we have innate rights. I think that we have an obligation and duties to follow certain virtues, and that those virtues might oftentimes run contrary to what you might consider an innate human right of which I don't consider an innate human right. So examples of this might be, I don't know, discrimination, let's say against transgender people using the bathroom or something like this. I don't consider that to be virtuous. And so I would be against such a thing, even though a person like you might say, well, wait a second, uh, this is a fundamental human right or something like this. The difference is, is that all of my positions on that are informed and I'm basing all of it, grounding all of it on the Bible and on God. You're grounding all, all of everything you believe is right just basically out of your own brain. What you think subjectively is a right and what isn't. Okay, so what do you then see as fundamental human rights? Fundamental? I don't think, for instance, uh, that people have the right to murder other people. I don't think they have the right to steal from other people. Um, there's kind of an inexhaustive normative list of things that I think we would likely agree on. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't see egalitarianism as being a fundamental human right. Never have. I think it's, like I said, in many cases, it's laughable like this one. I certainly don't see uh, OnlyFans as a right. I don't see speech as being necessarily a right. I don't see any of those types of things as being fundamental to the human experience or a human right. So I think, uh, I think you and I would see rights very differently. But unless you have a criticism of those things, which I'm happy to get into, you still are kind of question begging with the with the whole idea that, well, wait a second. No, it's the majority that gives rights. It's not the majority that gives rights. It's men that give rights. Men are the ones who can bestow them upon you and they're the ones who can take them away. We know this because collectively women cannot and have not ever been able to do this ever. I was saying that because you were using the thought experiment of, of imagine 80% you're at war. And then if 80% of the people at war are women and 20% of men, who do you think would win? And I was saying that instance, I think it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that the women would win, but you were disagreeing with that. But let's say they did win. Do women now have a basis for rights? If, if you, women were able to physically uh, overpower and take their their rights and give them to themselves somehow, sure. All you have to do is show me where that's ever happened. And I'm happy to say, hey, sometimes they do that, but they don't ever do that and have not ever been able to do that. And the reason they can't do that is because, uh, well, men are way fucking stronger and way more aggressive and have higher testosterone. And it seems to bother them far less to um, kill things than it does women. So that's why. Essentially, yeah, women are completely under the thumb of men, um, and everything outside of that is basically just an illusion. It's an illusion that we tell ourselves, but you're always appealing to men for your rights. There's no way around it. Okay, I guess I'm still trying to wonder why you're only applying this idea that if you can't physically enforce the rights, that means it's laughable just to women again if you're not applying it again. That's not what I'm saying. I'll say it again. So I'm handicapped. Maybe I'm missing... Yeah. I'll say it again, say it again, pretend for a second that there was a God, a God, not the God, right? We'll just pretend that there's a God and the God comes down and says, you and I are now equal. You can do everything I can do, except all the things that you can't do that I can do, but we're totally equal. Would you agree? Or if, the, if the God says to you, 
you are now me, you and I are now equal. You just can't do all the things I can do, right? I'm going to make you a God just like me, but you can do all the things that I can do, except certain things that you can't. Are you equal with that person or are you not equal with that person or that entity? I don't know if having the same strengths, again, is the basis for rights. Like I'm saying, I think we establish rights because we're accepting that people. Yeah, but just to, to, the, to the thought experiment, would you say that you were equal with that being or not? No, I don't think. Right. You don't you don't think. Right. Yeah. You don't think that because that would be absurd and laughable and paradoxical that the being who says to you now, let's say the being says now all the things I just gave you, I can also take away if you displease me, but we're equals. Would you, do you think that, do you think that uh, you would actually be equal with that being or no? Okay. Wait. So you're saying the idea that women's equality to men is laughable, but are you saying the basis of women's rights is laughable or just the equality? Well, I've already said this, that I think that women have the same rights as men do. Uh, in this particular case, whatever men decide to give them, it'd be the same thing that men decide to give other men. Uh, that's how traditionally it's always been done in every single society that we've ever been in. Um, so, I mean, nobody, nobody in any society that I'm aware of in, as normative uh, frame is able to just like murder women because they want to. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty absurd. So as far as fundamental rights go, because you and I see rights differently, yes, I think that women would have the same kind of rights I would express that men have, but it still would be a truism that men are the ones who are granting those rights. Okay. So then to kind of pivot slightly, given that, like, I'm guessing you don't support feminism or do you still support feminism, even though you think, or you think feminism is useless? Because well, this is why I asked your definition. Well, I didn't even really have to ask because you, you kind of let me let me know what you thought feminism was in the opening. And in the opening, what you said that feminism was, was a move towards egalitarianism and equality between men and women. So if that's the basis of feminism, then feminism would indeed be laughable. Because again, you would just be calling this grouping and monolith uh, and saying that they have equality with uh, the very people they're appealing to for equality who can then take it away whenever they so choose. I don't think I gave a sameness definition of feminism at all. I didn't say you did. And I said you said it was about equality. What? You said it was about equality. Yeah, that's what sameness feminism is. I think I was saying that modern feminism is about not devaluing feminine traits. <laughs> I don't think I said that feminism is about uh, propagating that men and women are equal. Andrew, can I very quickly, work. I want to really quickly clean up your position for the chat because uh, Rachel, your wife was saying what your position is. So I want to make sure this is accurate. So you're talking about the uh, what is right. But what about in terms of ought to do you ought, do you believe that women ought to have rights uh, rights as well? Or you're just talking purely about the what is? Well, I've already covered that. Right. So, yes, of course, I think that they're they ought to have the same rights okay. uh, ordinarily that uh, I would ascribe in a Christian virtue ethic to anybody. Sure. OK, got it. OK, cool. Yeah, I don't think that that's um, that's in any way contrasted to anything I say. No, I'm just not, saying that even really. then that even then I would still understand on the is front that those rights, whether I think they come from God or not, um, I still, I still believe that men would be the ones who are going to ultimately uh, be the enforcement arm for them and the ones who could take them away from me or give them to me whenever they so cho choose to do so, which historically they've done many times. Okay, so if men are the enforcement arm, what do you think they ought to be enforcing then? Like what rights do you think should be taken away from women or do you think you should still extend equal rights to women even though you could theoretically take them away? You mean as I'm trying to figure this out. What are you what are you asking me? I guess I'm asking what your point is. Like I guess what I'm you're saying that men can take My point is that you're not equal to men. That women aren't equal to men because you can't force their own rights. Men have to enforce them for them. So they're begging at the altar for men to enforce their rights while at the same time saying that they're equal to men. It's absurd. They're not equal to men. They they're never going to be there's never going to be an egalitarian society because of this one fact that men can collectively whenever they so choose even in a small collective just snatch your rights away and there's nothing you can fucking do about it. That's what I'm saying. That's why feminism is absurd. That's why the girl power shit's all fucking absurd. It's all stupid. It's all retarded. It makes no sense. 
because you're appealing. You are appealing to the people who could take your rights away for your rights and saying you're equal with them. It's absurd. That's not. And if, if that's not the position, then that's not feminism, because that's what feminism is. It's a push towards the egalitarian na uh, nature of men and women, saying that we're equal in every way. We're almost interchangeable widgets. That's that's what it's saying. That's what its proposal is. I think feminism, or at least in like the girl power strand that you were just describing, is saying that even though women are physically inferior to men, I, I don't think most women or the average feminist is going to argue that women uh, are physically equal to men or could physically overpower a man typically. I think they're more so saying that they're uh, generally as intellectually capable, obviously in the most extremes, I think. If you're comparing extremes, I think the most intelligent people are men and then also the dumbest people are men. But just in general, the average pools of men and women are generally equally as smart. So I think like the girl power strand of feminism is just saying that women are just capable in the workforce. They're just capable of making decisions. I So what? how does even what you were saying relate to that, to those virtues of feminism? So this is this is a pivot to kind of a, a whole different topic, which I'm willing to get into. But before before I do jump into that with you, uh, can can you make the concession that women's rights come fundamentally from men? I would make the concession that rights are established by the by the government uh, in the nation you live in, and then that the government is usually spearheaded by men. Yeah. If you don't, that's have not what I'm asking. Right. Can you agree, or do you still disagree that your rights, women's rights, fundamentally come from men? Do you agree or disagree with that? Because if you agree with that, you can concede and we can move off of this point. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, hey, we can hear you. Okay, I was plugging my phone. Sorry, repeat that one more time. I said, so again, I need to ask you one more time. Can you make the concession that women's rights come from men? If you make that concession and concede that, that point, we can move on to the next point. I don't think I can. I think I would, pr I think I, I'm not extremely religious, so I can't give you like a clean theological basis for rights, but I, I, I don't think I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. But I wish I had a better just, definition. This is why we keep on, I, I this, wouldn't make that concession. right. This is why we keep on going round and round on this, right? Because I make an argument, you, you would end up inevitably agreeing with what I'm saying but you still won't make the concession on the point because it collapses a large portion of your worldview. This is very common with feminists. You, you see know, what I'm saying? Hang on. Saying that, I, oh, uh, who's okay, able to enforce those rights isn't equivalent to the basis of those rights. So I'm saying just because rights can be violated by men, I don't think that means the basis of those rights is male determined. Does that make sense? Nope, it doesn't. It's still, you're still within the, the realm of the paradox. So, let me try this a different way. Let me try this a different way. Um, this, what I'm saying to you, the reason I often make this just normative statement to a feminist that their rights are dependent and reliant on men and men's benevolence. Because if we're malevolent, if we're acting in an evil way, we tend to subjugate and slave and things like this, right? But the reason I make this point, even, even though it's very normative, is because I think most people who are rational agents would just have to kind of agree that it's true on its face. There's really no way to argue with it. But the reason we end up going round and round and round in a circle and you look more and more absurd every time we circle it again is because you won't concede to it because it collapses a portion of your worldview. Men are the enforcers of your rights, not women. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? I agree that you're rights can be physically infringed upon but i don't know if that's the same as saying that because it can be infringed upon or violated that that means the basis of the right doesn't exist i guess that's my contention well who gives you these rights other than the agents who are enforcing them on your behalf you're not giving them to yourself 
So you didn't yeah, wake so up one morning. You didn't wake up one morning. By, I guess yeah. political rights are given by men. I'll concede on that. In terms of human rights, I guess I would have to probably research more and think about where I think human rights fundamentally come from. I guess I do see human rights as slightly different than politically afforded rights. Okay, so where do human rights come from? Like I said, I think I would have to probably give it a lot more thought. I think that that's a fair answer. So I don't, um, I don't expect you to have it. That's a, like that's a difficult question. So I think that that's a fair answer. Uh, maybe we can revisit that sometime down the road. But uh, the second thing uh, that you had uh, going off of my list here was um, progressive values for women lead to less fulfilling lives for progr progressive women on average. That was the other one that you took contention with. Am I, am I right there? Or I would just like, to, I guess I'd like to hear you elaborate more on it. I've heard conservatives say that uh, women fulfilling traditional roles tend to be happier. Is that kind of the crux of your argument? Well, it depends on what you mean by a traditional role. So I think people get these confused a bit. I think that um, a lot of times progressive women are thinking like a 1930s or 40s uh, utopian nuclear family dynamic household leave it to beaver style. Uh, but that's not actually correct. And we're talking about tradition. We're just basically doing everything within the frame of the religious. So when we're talking about progressive values, they're all based on secularism. So they have nothing to base anything on except their own subjective preferences. And so they end up in this kind of quagmire of contention. But if you want to just go off of empirics, the mental illness for women is off the charts in comparison to men. Uh, it's in fact, even seeking professionals for women is off the charts in comparison to men. So is the rates that they attempt in adolescent suicide in comparative com comparatively to men. Um, as the society, in other words, has become more egalitarian across the board, women seem to be suffering more, not less. In fact, there's a paper here, which I can link you. And this, um, this paper cites it pretty good. It's called an, an evolutionary, oh, I'm sorry. It's a, uh, the paradox of the, um, the leadership gaps and the paradox of the gaps when it comes to mental health and women. Uh, it asks the question, how come gains in women's rights haven't made women any happier? How come that hasn't actually done anything to produce these happy women uh, that uh, feminism promised us when feminism first began uh, uh, through the suffragettes? Like, what's the... Um, you know, what's 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 the aim here? What is the aim of feminism, if not a happier, better society for women? Why are they all so fucking miserable? The more egalitarian they get. Um, I guess it depends whether you value hedonism or not. I don't know if a lot of people consider happiness and pleasure as like the ultimate goal of life. Like, I think a woman could say maybe I'm happier, like less happy in this situation, but. I don't necessarily regret it. I think a lot of people do like pursuing something that gives them a sense of purpose. Um, but I don't know if necessarily pursuing something that gives you purpose leads to more pleasure in your life. Yeah, but what would be your explanation for uh, women having more trouble with mental health and reporting in almost every single individual aspect of their life that they're more miserable than when the polls that came before uh, pulled them in years past where they're saying that they were much happier? And society had a much larger gap between men and women with what women were allowed to do, including things like bank accounts, things like this. I mean, we've definitely come a long way with feminism, especially in the last 40 years. But the miserable index for women is at an all time high. I, I just I can't fathom how that could be possible as we close this gap. If feminism is accomplishing its goal, why women are more miserable under it. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily the answer, but I would say that if you asked me 10 years ago when I'm like 13 years old, if I have anxiety, I would say no, because I don't really have necessarily the self-understanding of what that means versus if you ask me now, I'd say yes. I don't think that necessarily means that I have more anxiety or that my life is worse than it was 10 years ago. I would say by every metric, my life is significantly better and that I'm significantly more fulfilled. So I think likewise, if women are kind of relegated to the household and to traditional roles and they're kind of isolated and they only they can't really A, B test what life is like outside of it, then I think it's easier to dismiss negative feelings. Like, I think you need to have. Um, so wait, hang on. I just want to make sure I got this right. Versa. I want to make sure I got this right. 
I want you to understand that the argument you just made was you said it's because those dumb housewives haven't experienced anything outside of being dumb housewives. So basically it's blissful in their ignorance. That's what you're saying. Um, I don't know if I would say dumb. I would say sometimes, hmm. For instance, I think they would, uh, I saw a statistic that says in some countries, like in uh, less developed countries, people there also report more happiness. But I don't think the average Western person would say that they have a better life necessarily. Like, I think we could look at them and say, okay, there are ways in which they have, no, in some ways, a lower quality of life, right? So that's why I don't know if just the <laughs> self-reporting on happiness is a good enough indication. Well, no, that wouldn't be. But I uh, have the information right here. More than a quarter of American women, 26%, take drugs, which include antidepressants. 26%. That more than a quarter of all women take antidepressants. Anti what is it? Andrew, what is it? What is it? What is it for 26, men? Twenty-six. What's that? What is that number for men? Just so we have a comparison. It varies between twelve to fifteen percent. Okay, got it. So it's much lower. Okay, much much lower. Same thing with antipsychotics. Okay, women aren't doing so hot, and all this egalitarianism that you've been pushing for that has been going full throttle. You've been getting everything that you feminists have wanted, and uh, when it's delivered unto you. You seem to go batshit fucking crazy. Isn't that weird? Isn't that odd to you? I think the number of people on antidepressants has gone up in general, even for men, right? Slightly, yes. But the deviation so between men and women... What would you attribute that uptick in uh, male usage of antidepressants to? I would say it's due to male oppression. The fact that men have been systematically oppressed inside of the United States under these horrific egalitarian laws where we don't have egalitarianism at all, but rather we get raped in divorce courts. The laws are fundamentally unfair. And for the same crime that a woman is charged with, men are unfairly punished. The suicide rates of men are sky high in comparison to women. They get the job done. It's not that women don't attempt it, but it's mostly a cry out for help because they take pills and then they call somebody and say, I took some pills, come save me. They put that up to a suicide attack. Whereas men just get the job done, right? They just take a gun and that's the way that they end up handling that. So all of these things, I would say that men are unfairly oppressed in society and that's led to a slight uptick. And there seems to be enough correlates there for me to make such a bold claim. But I would like to still know because we seem to just be begging the question, why in the world do you think that women who have more egalitarianism now than ever before have more of these gaps closed than ever before are more fucking miserable than ever before. Wait, I first have a question. So you said, so if men kind of established the framework of rights and happiness, why is it that men are the ones disproportionately uh, facing oppression in society? Well, remember what I said earlier, that men also oppress men, that men are the mechanism for that as well. I don't blame women for this. That's not the crux of my argument. I still think that men are the responsible party when it comes to the oppression in general of other men. But, but why in this are they particular disproportionately affecting men more than women if men are the ones who are like you said it's being it's not it's disproportionately courts. affecting women more than it is men. It's just that in this particular case when you're talking about the uptick, the, the slight uptick in things like suicidality and things like this, it's because the laws which are on the books tend to favor women. Because women are a great consumer arm for corporate America. They're in charge of most of the money. Literally, they, they're in charge of almost all consumer spending. So laws are kind of tailored to kiss their ass. Corporations and lobbyists have gone out of their way under feminism to make sure that women's asses are kissed. And men seem to suffer greatly because of that. Okay, so men create a framework that oppresses men so that they can make more money off female consumer spending is that what i said is that honestly no, what asking. you think i said i need to know is that honestly what you think i just said i'm asking yeah i know you're asking but you're asking a question that's not in relationship to anything i just said so the question doesn't even make sense it's, so what just happened would be like if i walk over to a guy and i say what color do you want me to paint your fence and he looks at me and he says um margarine hat be like what the fuck are you talking about right you might be asking me a question, but it's not in relationship to anything I just said. So 
if you, if you do you want to ask me a question in relationship to something I actually said? Sure. Can you summarize what your point was then? Yes. My point is that, again, as countries have become more and more egalitarian under feminism, under uh, and this is feminist women and feminist men who are coming together under the same banner of I heart women's rights. It's become more egalitarian. Why is it that the index for all of these mental illnesses and problems for women are through the roof? When feminism made the promise that these things should necessarily decrease. Feminism made the promise that mental illness for women would go down. That all aspects of women, that the quality, that the quality of women's lives would greatly increase. It has not seemingly done that unless you think that a woman's quality of life is not impacted by mental illness, which I would say it is. Especially if 25% are on an antipsychotic, antidepressant, or some variation thereof. I don't know if that's necessarily feminism's fault. Like you just said, we're in a framework in which sometimes laws are created to that like disaffect people mentally, like you just pointed to the divorce courts. I guess I'm just trying to wonder, why are you attributing the uptick in women's mental illness to feminism singularly? Like, how come you don't think it's just an effect of just, I don't know, other consequences of modern because behavior. Because women are the ones who have pushed, and, and feminists, male feminists as well, have pushed for egalitarianism. And across the board, in nations we see that become more egalitarian, we see this huge gap increase between men and women when it comes to women, A, wanting to do things that are more in line with their gender, which is a bizarre side effect feminists never want to talk about, but also that their state of mental happiness and mental health seems to rapidly deteriorate, which is fucking bizarre. These are, we can link this because we can look at other countries that have way more egalitarianism than even the United States, and we see similar numbers. Yeah, I guess I should probably read more about those studies, and then we can reconvene at a later time. I don't want to... Okay. Yeah. That's all I, I mean, I, that's all I really had, to be honest. I don't, I don't know where we go from there. Let me, uh, actually, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, Andrew, and then we can uh, move the call forward. So I was, as you guys were talking, I was just taking some notes. And there's a few things I wanted to ask you. So I was researching the whole, uh, you know, like men's happiness, women's happiness. What is that know, fucking clicking, dude? I don't know. It's not on my end. Bar, are you doing something? Oh yeah. Sorry. I'm like fidgeting. Okay, so I was researching, and so it seems that the cases that men's and women's happiness have been going down, but men's happiness has been going down more. So you do have a point there. But however, what's really interesting is that in the last 10 years, actually the happiness of both men and women has gone up, right? So it was kind of going down, 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 and then started going up. So I guess my question would be for you, if you know we are more egalitarian now than we were 10 years ago, then why has women's happiness actually gone up? From what? From what to what? From what years to which years? It started, seemed to, it's like started going up in like 2010 or something like that. It's Wait, what, well, link it over to me because I don't have the data in front of me to look at. Okay. Do you want me to just pull it up on the screen? Yeah. Well, link it to me. Okay. Yeah. Just put it in the private chat and then I'll take a look at it. Okay. There's multiple charts you have to look at. I'll send you both of them. By the way, did it decrease again? Did it go like this? In other words? So, yeah, so kind of like, yeah. it went, it went, no, no, it went like this, right? Mm -hmm. And then it went like this, basically. Right. Never, but was not you're probably going to come into another downward slope because that's how things like this generally work. So you'll see it go like this always on almost every single graph with a happiness index or any index. It goes like this, Alex. It'll start going up, then it'll decline, it'll go slightly up, then it'll decline, then it'll go slightly up, then it'll decline. So the uh, reasons there could be any number of reasons for this, including just which poll you're looking at at which time. It seems like there is. Well, this only goes up to 2016, so I don't know what happened after 2016. But it seems like there's no decline that I'm seeing on these charts. Is there like a specific chart that you're referencing that we can take a look at? Uh, yeah, I do have some data handy if you want to take a look at it, especially on the gender gap in, in mental health. So. Just more about like overall happiness based on gender. Yeah, but my point, my point isn't even based around the overarching happiness or overall happiness, but whether or not women have gotten more miserable as they become more equal or more egalitarian with men. 
and the appearances, yes, and that men themselves seem to do a lot better. There seem they seem to be doing even in the worst of circumstances uh, better than women who now have better circumstances than they've ever had. That's the point, regardless yeah. of what the external chart would, even if it showed the happiness index going slightly up or slightly increasing, I don't even think that that would contend with the point really, Alex. Well, if, if around 2010 women's happiness started progressively going up, wouldn't that kind of mute the whole argument? No, well, no, it still wouldn't. Uh, unless you can point to a bunch of uh, feminist uh, shit that got passed between 2010 and 2022 that led to massive egalitarianism, I doubt it. Oh, no, I, don't, I don't. I don't think feminism makes women happy, and that's yeah. not the point I'm arguing. I'm I would saying, expect in almost any constantly. chart, yeah, in almost any chart that you would look at for a happiness index or drug taking index or anything else, it would always there would always be a point of decline where it hits bottom and then begins to gradually go up begin to start to stabilize and then maybe start another long drop. So it's hard to say exactly why that would be. There's a poss- Wait, far, you got to stop typing. It's super loud. And like the whole chat is going crazy. Uh, do you think though it's possible that maybe it's a non sequitur, meaning there's other things that have caused women's happiness and men's happiness too, but to a lesser extent go down between like 1950 and 19 or 2000. Do you think there could be anything else that could have done that? Although there's tons of factors, nothing's ever one sided. Um, or has one faucet to it. There, it's probably a multifaceted issue, of course. There okay. could be tons of other factors that come into play, but that still just kind of begs the question for this factor, which we do see a high correlation with in almost every nation that has feminism and egalitarianism in the first world, that as they become more egalitarian, this bizarre split begins to happen where not only do women start doing more traditionally womanly things when it comes to their jobs, which is bizarre, you would think that they wouldn't, but suddenly they don't want to become trash collectors. Suddenly they don't want to become dump truck drivers. Suddenly they don't want to become electricians. They don't want to become any of those things they fought so hard to, to become. It's so weird. But they actually move towards the opposition when they have full egalitarianism, interestingly enough. Yeah, like intuitively, when you first made the argument, I was actually like agreeing with you because intuitively it makes sense. But then when I saw like the data change around 2010, what started going up, that does kind of make me question how important. Is- I actually can't see this this chart because it just I, I, I just I, gave I, me I, an I, image. So, yeah, it's an image. Yeah. Yeah. But they, it doesn't actually pull the image up in the URL. Do you want me to just share the screen so you can see it real quick? Far, I just mute Yeah. What, what's it called? What's it called? Uh, what do you mean? What's it called? What's it's, the chart uh, called? It's called, uh, I don't know. It's like a woman's men's happiness comparison or something like that. Here, I'll just share the screen. You can take a look at it. Okay. But I still want to, I want to look at the source myself to see if there's information you might be not overlooking. Yeah, we can do that. Who the fuck this, drew that? What did, where did you is, get this? This looks like this it was from, drawn by a 12 year old. No, no, this is, this is, this is from Vox. <laughs> oh, Vox. Very progressive source Vox. I know, but you would think that, but that's kind of most of the sources I've seen is they're saying that basically something. Well, show me another one. Show me okay. another source. Okay. Okay. That I can actually pull up and so I can look at the data myself. Okay. Uh, one second. Because everything I'm seeing shows that single moms more likely to be in poverty. All the risk for fatherlessness. Kids goes up because of that. Basically, all of these things in egalitarian nations greatly increase oh, to be fair this is the uk but i, I think uk is also following this no, dude well. come on man so, wait what, what, what's so bad about give this? me a chart for the united states that's making your point for you so i can look at it don't just make it a chart that doesn't have any information because that doesn't help me i can't well, actually is, look at anything I, I can pull up i can pull up the original argument article. yeah do that more worth one but i'll suffer anxiety the report reveals so okay so where do, where do you want me to go well link the article start with that okay so this is, this is the chart in question here. This chart shows how happiness rates for both men and women, blue, orange, have increased since the service in 2011. They both have leveled off and grown closer to get 2015, 16. So basically it's saying that in the last decade, men and women have been doing no, better. No, it's not saying in the last decade. It's saying through the, what, 2015 and 2016. But where's the data after that? We're not, last I checked, we're not in 2015, 2016. Well, do you have, uh, that's why I'm asking you, do you have any data about like something more recent? Cause I haven't been able to find it. So all I see, all we see is that it kind of yeah. started going up. Well, like for instance, know. you can intuitively know that this can't be true because just during the lockdowns, you would, you would see something more akin to a dip down, right? Just because of that one factor, you would have sure. to see that in modernity. So, and we would have to compensate and account for that as well. 
Sure. So but no, I don't. I don't have a chart off the top, uh, or you know, like at my disposal any more than you did. I didn't know which topic we would actually go with, so I didn't have it prepped. Right. You don't have you to know, get defensive, time. Andrew. I'm just bringing up a point. I'm not trying to debate you. I'm just uh, making a point. You know, maybe to get you to question your. Not being defensive. Okay. Uh, I'm the responding to what you're saying. Okay. The second question I had for you was more of a hypothetical. Uh, I'm just curious to hear what your answer on this is. If women collectively started taking mass amounts of steroids and became as strong as men, would you then change your position on having a legatarian society or no? If what now? Say that again. Hypothetically speaking, if women collectively started taking mass amounts of steroids and became as strong as men, <laughs> would you then change your position on the egalitarian, egalitarian society? No, I think that there's also uh, intuitive things that men are better at. They're naturally better at. Um, and even then I think that men would still have an advantage, even if the strength somehow in this hypothetical monolithically was equalized, I still think that men would have an advantage though. I would have to rethink the entirety of the position then of where rights came from, because the advantage would be significantly more limited. I would agree that that's true, but I still think we'd have advantages in other domains. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Anyway, so let's, uh, I just had those two questions. Let's just get back to the initial debate. I don't want to like start like debating myself. So um, I'm sure you guys have plenty of other points of contention. Uh, what were some of the things that you mentioned? You gave me a list of six things in the beginning. We did two and three. What was number one? What was number four? What was number five? Yeah, so the first one is that women's suffrage and the women's right to vote has been bad for democracy and bad for women in general. Do you disagree with that one, Farah? Oh, sorry, I have you muted. Let me unmute you. There we go. I wasn't typing, by the way. I think it's just my... Yeah, it was like, well, as soon as I muted There's you. There's like a finger tap. Like, I think you got your finger next to your phone yeah. tapping. Yeah, as soon as I muted you, the clicking went away. Like, you're good now. Right now, there's no noise. Yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. There's, oh, fuck. I don't no, know what it is. I'm not typing. It's okay. It's no big it's, deal. It's, you're good. Yeah, let's just, let's just ignore that. Uh, so, yeah, did you, do you agree with what he said or no? I'm assuming you don't agree with that. Is that women's, say it again? Women's, now, women's suffrage and the women's right to vote has been bad for democracy and women. I mean, I'd probably disagree. I guess if we have these specific topics, I guess if we were to talk about feminism in a broad way, it's harder to read and think about it. But I guess if we have specific topics in mind, like if you want to talk about women's happiness and feminism and then the basis of human rights, we can always reconvene and I can like read more about it and then come to a more concrete opinion on these things, I guess, right now. I, that sounds fair. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Alex, you can always bring on guests if you want to from, you know, get, kill 40 minutes with Q&A or something. Yeah, sure. I guess the second thing I would bring up, which I think you guys might, uh, you might be, it might be better as a discussion, is gender roles. So uh, I'm assuming Andrew believes in very strong traditional gender roles. Uh, I'm assuming Farah, you do not, or am I wrong? Yeah, that would be incorrect. I think that the construction of gender is false and that there's only sex and sex roles and that okay. what you would consider to be gender is actually conflated with sex and that gender, gender in and of itself is nothing more than fashion. It's that's all it is. It's just a here and now fashion statement, essentially. And I don't, I don't think that gender as you understand it and as I understand it, I think are completely different things. I think that you when you think of gender, you're just thinking of behaviors that are feminine. Uh, and when, when I think of gender, I think of sex roles and that the sex roles themselves are what contributes to the behavior, not choices necessarily. Okay, sure. So just rephrasing from gender roles to sex roles. You believe that biological males, men, should mm -hmm. act like men. You don't believe that they should be the caretakers, for example, or they should be like you believe they should work. They should do masculine shit and the woman should stay home with the kids. Right? believe Absolutely. that men should act in a way that is virtuous under the confined paradox of deontological Christian ethics and virtue ethics. Yes. So under that, would, would you would say that masculinity uh, in and of itself, which is part of the nature of a man, should most definitely be pushed, not restricted, not confined. But with that should come the virtues, things like temperance, self-control, all of those things that allow the bigger, stronger sex to control themselves from being a bunch of rabid, uh, you know, disgusting animals, essentially. So, yeah, I think that masculinity is extremely important to society, but that men need to have their behavior tempered a bit and their judgment tempered a bit uh, with virtue. Do you believe there's such a thing as toxic masculinity? Um, I, it depends on how you mean it. If you mean 
like, can some of these red pill idiots go too far with this shit? Yeah. I think that Andrew Tate can go way too far with the shit that he says. I think that I might draw the line at like touring another nation for a 14 year old bride or something like, I think that that gets beyond toxic and into just insane to be honest with you. But generally I think you would be hard fought or I would be hard pushed to say that any kind of real masculine trait is toxic in any way, shape or form. I think almost every masculine trait's a good trait. And I so think the, that women love us for having them. So Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. So the one that I always reference in debates is one aspect of what I think I would consider toxic masculinity is the stigma for men to get mental health help, right? There, there's just a little bit of a stigma about it, right? It's much more socially acceptable for women to go to a therapist than it is for men. So that's what would be something that I would personally consider to be quote unquote toxic masculinity. So that's that's an example. Why is that? Why is that toxic, though? Why do you think that that's, that, uh, that that's toxic? Do you, I think that psychologists, think which are oh, psychology in general, is overwhelmingly saturated with women. And um, I don't think that men going to women for their issues is necessarily the best idea. And I think that a most, woman, you can go to male therapists. Yeah, but I think that a lot of psychology in and of itself is bullshit guesswork. I think it's just bullshit guesswork. I don't think it's particularly helpful. I don't think that antidepressants and the overprescription of them has been good for society at all. And I think it's much smarter that men don't generally go out to try to seek uh, mental health professionals to help them out with their psychological profile. I think the reason they don't seek it out nearly as much is because they have what women never seem to be able to have, which is friends. They have actual friends and they hang out with them for hours and hours at a time and have lifelong friendships with them and confide in them and things like this. And I think that their friends tend to help them out quite a bit. So all right, we, we fundamentally disagree on that point. Do you, do you think men have more friends than women? I think that they have more real friends than women. I think that women can easily get a lot of associates, but that when you're talking about long-term friendships, I think men are generally better at being friends with each other than women are. And I think that women value male friendship as much as men do and value women's friendship about as much as men do, which is not very much. <laughs> That's just my take though. I don't have any, I don't have any empirics for that. That's just my intuition kind of as we're going off topic. I'm sure okay. that I could dig that up though. If you want me to come back for a debate, no, it's cool. I, I it's almost cool. guarantee I just, I just that to, it's true. I just want to explore your thinking. Far, do you disagree with any of what he just said? Uh, well, I have a question for him. He was saying psychology is kind of oversaturated with women. I was going to say then, do you think psychology is a good tool for women or would, are you against? I think psychology is a bad tool for most people at most times and that it has a history of being directed by people who are kid diddlers and psychopaths themselves and that the modern uh, transgender phenomenon and many of the modern phenomenons that we see as a social contagion in society come from an overt amount of psychoanalysis from people who are trying to basically MK ultra your fucking mind. That's what I think. I think that psychology and, anti and the prescription of antidepressants wide and in mass has been terrifically bad for society. It's not good for us at all. We shouldn't be taking these fucking drugs. Uh, and we never should have been. We never should have uh, started on this mass prescription campaign to just dope down the entire public. That's a terrible idea. Um, I guess that um, speaks specifically to like gender affirming therapy. Restroom. Are you just against that type of like psychological treatment like do you think there could be a healthy form of psychological treatment that addresses the social contagion of what you see as gender dysphoria or do you think all of it is what's causing it psychology as a as a field i think that it's definitely helped with a mass push towards it including uh we give so much credit to these organizations like the apa the american psychological association for instance and they have things that are on the books that are clearly mental illnesses and due to the lobbying campaigns of various groups they will take those things off the book as a mental illness and basically capitulate to the mob, even though quite clearly it's a mental illness for a person to be screaming in their head that they have to get out of their body or dismember their body to become the opposite sex. That's fucking insane. But to the move to classify this as other than mental illness is bizarre to me. And this happens due to lobbying from these groups with tons and tons of money. And uh, they're able to leverage organizations like the APA. I have a video of the, pre the former president of the APA talking about conversion therapy, where he says it was never really tried before the homosexual lobby came in and began to massively leverage the APA um, to drop homosexuality as a mental illness. So I don't have a lot of faith, a lot of stock 
in psychological institutions. It's a soft science. It's never been a hard science. Nobody's ever classified it as a hard science. The empirical data can almost never be replicated. It's it's the top at the replication crisis under the sociology banner. So yeah, I, I have a lot of problems with uh, psychology and psychoanalysis. And I think that the overprescription of society is terrible for us. And I think that Alfred Kinsey, who started the trans movement in general, was a sick kid diddler. Yes. I like agree with all the things you said. My only critique would be, I feel like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, meaning like trans, like uh, whatever confirmation therapy, whatever the fuck it's called, is a small, small part of therapy. Like most people are not going to there for that. I think for some people, like including myself, I've been very public about the fact that when I was going through a hard time, I went to therapy and it was like very, very good for me, right? Like it prevented me from becoming an alcoholic, prevented me from even potentially doing something worse, right? So I think it can be very good if you go to the right therapist though. That's a key precondition. Let me ask you a question. Did they put you on any antipsychotics? No, I've never taken an antipsychotic. Right. So that's the thing. When we're talking about this, remember that um, a response to therapy or things like this, a lot of this is the issuance around um, antipsychotic drugs. Anti yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. Yeah, Whoa. but these are all things that begin to move your state of mind into a suggestive state of mind where you can you can then through heavy suggestion be led to do all sorts of different things it's a mass dumbing down of the public from psychologists honestly from that uh, entire field yeah but i think you have to separate antidepressants from antipsychotics right antipsychotics i fully agree with you should not be prescribed to anyone who isn't like full-on straight up psychotic right i do agree those are over prescribed and i do agree with you that antidepressants are also over prescribed just like you know um whatever, like just like Valium is, just like Ritalin is, just like all that shit is overprescribed. So I agree with you on that. But for certain people, SSRIs can actually be very, very beneficial. Like for example, again, with me, when I was going through a hard time, I was having panic attacks, me getting on SSRI stopped that from happening and it didn't dumb me down. My intelligence level stayed the same. It was just something that like, you know, when you have a brain imbalance, that could be useful in the right circumstance. I'm sorry, you were, you, you were breaking up really bad there. For some reason, I'm having a bad hiccup. Where did you Where did you lose me? I'm still I'm still losing you here, kind of intermittently, and I'm I'm not really sure why that's happening. Hang on, just give me a second. Maybe it'll okay. correct itself. Far, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this is it. It looks like maybe it correct corrected itself. Yeah, go go ahead, okay. man. So Sorry. the point I was trying to make is I do agree with a lot of the stuff you're saying. I agree with you that antipsychotics should never be used unless the person is like straight up psychotic. I do agree with you that those are overuse. I do agree with you. They can lead to disastrous side effects like shootings and uh, suicide. Uh, but I think that SSRIs, while they are overprescribed, which not mm -hmm. as often they are, can be very beneficial to certain people at some point in their life. Like for That's me, for going to be true about everything, even bad things. There, You could say that it could be true that a person being an alcoholic could be better than the alternative of him not being an alcoholic in some limited cases. So That's I would concede that in some limited cases, this may be a helpful thing for some people. However, I'm going to maintain that you may have been able to got, have gotten the same exact help from spiritualism or from your religion, which is something that's absent in your life that you may have gotten from this over-the-counter drug. And I think that as we've replaced religion in society, we just give them drugs. We kind of see this trend, don't we? Of over-prescription, people on antipsychotics, antidepressants everywhere, it's just proportionately, of course, affects women, especially since women generally seem to adopt the religion of their husband. And as we become more and more religious, uh, you see that there's less and less women again who have any type of real staunch religious values. So this is uh, I think that this kind of goes part and partial that we have outsourced um, any form of spiritual fulfillment to people psychoanalyzing us and giving us drugs, man. I'm not sure that that's the best idea. I, I do agree they should be prescribed more seldomly, but I do think in the right – I don't think it's an equivalent to like alcohol. Like alcohol, maybe in very extreme cases, it could potentially somehow benefit you. I don't think SSRIs are like even close to that. I think they're three degrees different. I think SSRIs, again, for a person who has yeah, – It's like, not directly – it, look, it's not – nothing I'm saying as a comparison is directly analogous. It's why it's just a, it's just a comparison of the extreme. I'm just looking at the extremes and saying, of course – there, there can be cases where drugs like this, I'm sure, can help people. But on average and by and large, I think it's been pretty much disastrous. And you seem to agree with that. 
Um, I think they're overprescribed. I do think they've also saved a bunch of people's lives who who would have otherwise committed suicide. Yeah, but they might have ended up uh, greatly destroying other people's lives due to the overprescription. So it's like, sure. yeah. you know, you have to be you have to be very cautious when you make a statement like that, right? It's sure. like maybe they have, but maybe they've also destroyed more lives than they've saved. Like we don't know. Well, like, like every brand new phenomenon. Well, like everything, moderation is the key. I mean. You, someone who's like recreationally drinking whiskey on the weekend, that's totally fine. If someone is drinking 12 glasses of whiskey and then getting behind the car, like they're both drinking yeah. alcohol, but they're not in the same category. You know, moderation is always the key, you know, for the people. If that person, for example, is taking certain prescriptions, he should not be drinking. If that person is like really young, you know, he should not be drinking because that will fuck up his like. Whatever yeah, brain but Alex, I don't disagree. Was, like, I'm not going to disagree with any of those normative claims. I think they're all true. Of course, that's true. Like moderation is necessary for the success of any human being anywhere in life doing anything and uh, any activity you can do too much of, and it can be bad for you. Like even drinking water, like you do excessively, even that can be bad for you. And it's not water, dose. Andrew, this is kava for God's sake. Okay, I'm just saying, right. Even that can be bad for a person. I don't even think we have a disagreement here to be honest okay. with you. No, so I'm we'd just, just be arguing. We'd be arguing kind of just some nuance at the fringes and who cares really. I was just curious about your position on that because that's something that I always debate people about. Um, far we so I think what we can do next is just bring on people from the chat. I think quite a few people have questions for you, uh, or did you want to discuss something else, Far, before we do that? Um, well, I did have a question. Hearing that discussion, okay. So if you view gender dysphoria as a mental illness, but then you're also kind of opposed to like the institution of psychology, what would be the best way to treat it, just through like spiritualism or religion? Because I don't feel like that would work in cases of other mental illnesses like schizophrenia. why not that's how it always traditionally worked traditionally mental illness was treated by spiritual people spiritual fathers it was treated even in localized tribes by shamans people like this and by the way before there was mass amounts of psychologists all over the place and and we were psychoanalyzing everybody and their brother if we go back uh 90 80 years we find that the trends in depression and uh, suicide and things like this are greatly decreased they're they're much less it's much 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 less okay so, so as religion society, was very think... when re, when religion when any society is highly religious you see those issues greatly decrease even psychologists will say that that's true that that people who live spiritual lives seem to have much less cases of uh, or less cases of mental illness depression things like this the numbers bear that out the more religious they are generally the lower that trend is there's a lot of people who pay lip service and say they're religious who aren't so when you look at the stats, you have to really dive into them. But the more on the side of the religious that you are, seemingly, the less likely you are to have those types of issues. And historically, that's been the trend as well. I guess I was asking whether that extends to other types of mental illnesses like schizophrenia. Or do you think that's more particular to depression and anxiety? Yeah, the, the Catholic Church, especially, uh, but Protestant churches traditionally had uh, hospice cares that they would privately fund. For people who had conditions like that, which are completely irreversible, and psychologists can do very little about them now. They can do very little about those conditions now except create care facilities to put people in. That's it. Okay. So you don't believe medic like same way you're saying that medication isn't typically the best solution for depression. So you feel similarly for those other mental illnesses as well. It probably does more harm than help generally for things like schizophrenia. Well, I mean, yeah, we, we haven't been able to cure any of these. We haven't been able to cure dementia or schizophrenia or the decline in cognitive ability. We just create facilities to put these people in. I do think that it's a good idea maybe to continue with drug development to try to treat some of these things, but an overprescription of them is terrible. Just like an overprescription of antibiotics would be terrible. That's how you end up with antibiotic resistant diseases, right? Uh, trying to govern the mind with drugs is a great new frontier and great new experiment, and it's not going very well so far. We don't really know what the ramifications of it all will be yet. And I'm very cautious about that. So just saying. Okay, that's fair. So the way you see transgenderism as a social contagion, do you feel that way for also uh, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia? No, BPD, I didn't say that those were social contagions. No, I'm asking. No, those aren't social contagions. Those are biological conditions. Dementia is a biological condition. Schizophrenia is a biological condition. These aren't just mental conditions at this point. These are actual physical conditions that are physical ailments. So these, these transcend just the mental. These aren't just, there's people, there's people who have sudden onsets of dementia 
who didn't before have it, who were completely cognitively perfect and had no depression of any kind, no mental illness of any kind. These are physical conditions you're alluding to. Those aren't social contagions. A social contagion would be something that's all in the mind, but because it's been pushed out in the general public through mass media indoctrination and things like this, people begin to believe it, that that thing is true or that they should participate into it, just like with propaganda. That would be a social contagion. That's a whole different category.